Brian, thank you for taking time today to be on the Silicon Valley podcast. Now, it's very interesting. I mean, today I was on your sh- live show. Thank you for that opportunity. But with that, I mean, we had a great conversation after, and I just thought, oh my gosh, we got to start recording this. We got to get this you know, down. We got to get it out to the masses. So with that, let's just start. Brian, could you give our audience a little bit of background of your career up until this point and kind of what your focus is? Yeah. So uh, let's go back about 10 years where I had uh, a, an idea to bring character to leadership, but character doesn't sell. I mean, you tell somebody who's stepping into leadership, you need to work on your character. They kind of rear back and say, I don't have a problem. And so I learned of this term called emotional intelligence. And as at the time I was a, a manager at, at the role I was holding and essentially left that role and applied for a small position in a Stanford incubator program that helped me put this idea into uh, business form. I knew nothing about, you know, what it looked like to put together a business plan. And I didn't know that you could put this, you could bring this to, to market and come to find out you could. And so I was selected one of five into this program, went through that program, got then hired at a nonprofit that helps com- uh, people start their businesses who have no experience called Renaissance. It's a, it's a nonprofit here or near here in East Palo Alto and throughout the Bay. So I was a consultant for them for about five years and then got hired on at a, um, a I'll say a global incubator that focuses on life sciences and worked with uh, companies that were looking to scale internationally in that space. Meanwhile, from the incubator program that I got accepted into, I started consulting around emotional intelligence and communication. And then if, I would say about a year ago, I connected with a friend who's now a good friend of mine. His name is Anthony Lees with Heroic Voice. Interesting. How did you connect with this individual? Ah, funny you should ask. A uh, great individual introduced us, actually, and I think it's actually been about two years now, that a guy named Sean Flynn. I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so connected us, and we hit, we hit it off, and we started doing a weekly show called The Presentation Gym, where I would just ask questions. I, would, I felt like essentially I was just the, the personality, right? And he break, got brought great content and I started incorporating the EQ to these communication skills. And we just kind of just leveled up our, our, our game around business development, uh, executive coaching and communication coaching. And so he and I have been working together now for about two years and I just stepped on with him full time at Heroic Voice Academy as a, as an executive communication coach and also as an executive coach in business development. So hold on right there. In my mind, maybe I'm wrong, and I'm thinking our audience might think that when you're an executive, you got everything figured out. You're set. Is this true or not? Absolutely not. In fact, you're, you're for the most part, a specialist, which is great. Like you know your, your market well, you know your product or service well. And in, in the incubator I worked with for, for a couple of years, you would see a lot of professors coming out of academia all over, you know, all over the world where they've done their research on, you know, bioscience, life science, uh, and they were specialists, but they were, what I learned for a lot, for all intents and purposes is they were very siloed. They're very siloed in their thinking. And so those who excelled knew what they knew and they knew what they didn't know. And you ask, well, how do you know what you don't know? Well, you're, you're a humble leader. And they quickly started to learn what they didn't know and bringing in partnerships to help compensate for that. When you're saying they brought in partners to help compensate, would that be other team members, other employees, or is that consultants? Who are these people that they would bring in that they would, that would complement them? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it's different for everybody. It's, it depends on what your go-to-market strategy is, like where you're going to begin. If you're in product development, uh, you may need a CTO to kind of help you scale once you have a, a demo ready to go. You may need a you know, chief financial officer to help get your uh, financials right, to manage the money, whatever it may be, and whatever your go-to-market strategy is, whatever stage you're in, you, you systematically bring in the people to help buy back your time. 
right? You can't do everything. You can't know everything, but it, you, you do have to learn a little bit about everything. So you start bringing in people who help you give back your time. So you said you're executive coach or executive communication coach. That skill, that communication, do you start developing it after you hit a certain level or when do you start developing that? And, and then after, I really want to start pivoting into working with those founders. You said that were PhDs, were these top intellectuals and in their companies. But first, what stage should you be at to start wanting to work on communication skills? Right now. You should be working on it right now because again, you can have a great product or service and, and, and the best product or service doesn't always win at the end of the day. You're only as good as you can communicate is what I often say. And if you have a 10 out of 10 product, but your communication skills is four out of 10, you're only going to be perceived as the four. So as you start to ramp up your company and just because you got a product or service doesn't necessarily mean you have a, a company yet. So you have to start communicating the vision and the values of this product or service as a company to those you bring in as well as the market. You can't just start talking zeros and ones because for the most part, this will go over your, your market's head. Um, so you have to now bring in someone who can communicate that or learn it yourself. And as a CEO, you should always be in the driver's seat of, of the messaging that you're wanting to, to share. Because again, it's you as the, as the founder, the president, the CEO, whatever title you, you hold that is communicating the message of your product or service. Okay, let's talk about that message. You're a startup, brand new, brand new. And I'm guessing this message changes throughout the life cycle of the company, but brand new idea, you're going out, you're talking to people for the first time. How does that message look? That's a good question. And what a lot, a lot of um, inexperienced communicators will do. And, and let me say something to that point. It is hard to say you're an inexperienced communicator. And in fact, a, a lot of people will miss that fact. If you, if you say to somebody who isn't ready to be a leader, you need to work on your communication skills, they'll dismiss you. And that's the sad part because again, they could have a great product or service that is going to just crush the market. But unfortunately, the person who is bringing this to market can't communicate. And so it does take um, I believe coaching for someone to be successful in the market. So what does it look like in the beginning when someone says, okay, I get it. I want to be the, the difference, right? I want to make sure that I'm moving this along. What it really looks like is, okay, clearly and very succinctly, what is your vision for this product, right? What is your vision? And that includes, you know, what, what market are you bringing this to? You know, like we are addressing this market, this pain point, and we sell this and we are going to scale this. So th there's a lot that goes into kind of bringing context and content. Uh, most importantly, the value of the product. Because if you don't have a value prop for this product or service, the information will go over people's heads. And then what, what are you committed to doing? Often we call this the vow, right? The vision, value, vows. Where is this product going? What are the values? And when, what, are you, what are you committing to do for your market? So this communication, does it change on who the audience is? If I'm talking to engineers, am I talking to them the same way as a group of salespeople or marketers or even maybe Gen Z and Gen Y? I don't know. Or is it, how flexible should this message be? Well, yeah, knowing your audience, because you have a connection with your product or service or your message, and you need to have a connection with your audience, and your audience is going to always be changing. So you could be talking to directly the consumer. You could be talking to your team. You could be talking to funders. The audience is going to change, and so will the message. And again, you do not want to step on stage or in front of a microphone and give them everything. So you need a message portfolio. It needs to be broken down. There will be times where everything needs to come out, but for the most part, you're gonna cut that up and focus specifically on what that audience is, is looking, looking for. And that requires empathy and relatability when it comes to understanding your, your message and your audience. Dive in a little bit more of that empathy and relatability. Also dive into, that was very interesting what you said, the message portfolio. You explain that a little bit more. 
Yeah. So a message portfolio is, again, if you think of your TED Talk, right, if you're going to create a TED Talk, that is going to be your education. It's going to be your overview. It's going to be a little deeper dive. Most messages are, are chunked into time. You may give an hour interview. You may give an hour presentation. You may have only two minutes to give a, an elevator pitch. So you can't get an hour conversation in a two minutes, no matter how hard you try. And of course, then your message changes and the context, and then of course the content. So let me give you an example. If you were speaking to a, a group of salesmen, you're going to want to educate them on the product that they're selling. Now imagine if you're speaking to shareholders. Now you're giving more like a town hall meeting. You're, you're giving an overview and the vision of where this product is going, who you're helping, what are the numbers. It's a little bit different. You're not going to give the educational piece to the town hall meeting, and you're not necessarily going to give a lot of the numbers to the salespeople, right? You're giving the basic insights of how this product addresses a pain point and could ultimately be the best solution. So it does change from context and the content will change as well. Wait, Brian. Say I'm a startup, I have a pitch deck. Is my message one message for that deck or is it a different message for every slide? Yes. So a pitch is a very unique presentation because it's a summary of all the, all the slides that you're presenting. So for example, if you're using a uh, Sequoia pitch deck you, or a Forbes pitch deck, you may have up to 15 slides. If you have a Guy Kawasaki uh, slide deck, you may have only 10. So you're going to have probably 90 seconds to two minutes, not very long for each slide. If you're giving a more extended presentation, in whatever context that you're given that opportunity, it may be a little bit more in depth, right? Shareholders, um, mergers, acquisitions, you're going to give a more of a deeper presentation than you would uh, a pitch. It's very precise and concise. And each slide is, again, almost like an elevator pitch of that particular conversation. Okay, so let's break it down. Team slide. How do I communicate that? So a team slide doesn't read like a resume. I mean, this is just from a coaching perspective. It shouldn't read like a, 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 a resume because it doesn't, doesn't build trust. It doesn't create a connection. It doesn't uh, provide a story that you know furthers a, a, a second conversation or empathy or relatability or passion or anything like that. So what it really should be is, again, the presenter should be a little bit vulnerable and say who they've brought in to complement their weakness and why they're strong. And there should be a story. You know, what is their background? What is their expertise? And then then it leaves a little bit also of a hole for the next person. Like they specialize in marketing strategies so that when we go to market, this particular person you know, has this expertise, that's resume. Or it could sound like this. Uh, Sean has X amount of years in marketing where he's uh, connected with XYZ. He has a deep relationship. He loves, you know, you tell a story uh, and, and you don't tell them everything. But that type of presentation is much different than once you get to the financials, where it's numbers, it's projections. Uh, but still, the arc of the, of the presentation should be in story fashion and should consistently, through all of them, point you in a particular direction, be anchored to values, and highlight your commitment to whoever your audience is. Okay. Yeah, I'd almost want to go slide by slide with the problem, the solution, the market, everything, but huh. that's a particular slide. So when you talk about the problem solution slide, you get very, you get very particular and that's where you have an opportunity to uh, demonstrate and communicate relatability. Now, if you've just identified a market opportunity with, with numbers, I don't know if that is as effective as being very clear with the actual pain in that particular market, how you're solving that through a hu real human 
a human specific uh, example by telling stories. For example, we, uh, I, I gave an interview with the CEO of Visby Medical and Adam, Adam was just masterful at connecting with his audience because he talked about how his company was working on solving the, the problem with cancer. And he had a very close friend who died of cancer. And he remembered as he was going through this experience, how his family, how his friend who was suffering with cancer was waiting for a solution. So Adam was very effective in communicating somewhere there's a patient waiting. So they were constantly pivoting. When COVID hit, their company was focusing on STD Home, home STD kits. When COVID hit, they then redeveloped uh, home kits for, for COVID. Again, it was the model, the vision, and the bold promise. Constantly remember that somewhere there was a patient waiting, but he would always go back to this very specific story that motivated him to get into this company. How important is it to be able to tell stories? Oh, it's huge. Again, it's, it's about empathy. It's all about relatability. And when you tell stories, you make that head heart connection. And that's really what communication is all about. Sure, I could tell you the facts, I could give you the information, but everyone is going to do something different with those facts and that information. And if you can drop the conversation into the heart, uh, people will trust it. People don't care what you can do for them until they know you care. And when you communicate value, so here's an example of how you can kind of do that. If I said to you, Sean, family is important. I'm communicating to you the importance of family. But what I'm not doing is telling you about my family. You are automatically seeing your own family in that. And so the ability to, to, to communicate that and for people to see their own experience in the conversation, in the story, if that, make, if that makes sense uh, off the top of my head, is key because that, that's where you then develop relatability, even though you have different experiences. That's interesting that when they can kind of visualize or connect in their own head the story, I guess that connection would be so much more powerful, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that is the responsibility of a good communicator is to use words where people can see their own experience in those words. If I'm a startup, does my communication change when I'm pitching investors or when the company's growing or when I'm recruiting new, new employees, does it change at all? Well, so, some of the messaging changes, right? The content and the content will slightly change. So the content and context, the difference of, of that can, can be very subtle, but you have a consistent, again, vision for the company. You have a connection to specific values and, and a commitment to people. And so if you're talking to an audience or a team or investors, if you are anchored in those three things, I I believe, again, the words will change, but the relatability, the trust, the experience of those who are listening will be consistent. And, And that's what you want. The words may change, but the relationship is consistent. Now, how do you go about coaching someone to improve? Are there any I don't want to say drills or practices, but, you know, what's step one, I guess, to move forward? Yeah. So it could be as simple as think of, let's, let's use the vision, value, and vows example. And you have somebody who's launching a company that just rattles on and on about their, their product or service, and it's not really focused. And they're giving you all the information. And it feels like you're drinking out of a fire hose with that information. So at the end of the day, you want people to comprehend what you're saying and comprehend it in a way where then they turn around and engage. So if you think of social media, people are putting out a limited amount of information, but it causes and it creates engagement and there's comprehension. People remember it, they share it, but that's huge. So you could begin with, tell me, Sean, about the Silicon Valley podcast in 15 seconds. And that, that practice, you'll start to flush out what is a priority. It's like a fire drill. If you are trapped in, if this room is on fire, if you're trapped in a burning building, what would you grab? I'm just thinking of that Seinfeld episode 
where George is pushing everyone away to get out of the building. So, uh, probably not the best. <laughs> good, good visual. Yeah. Hey, you know, that, that story connected with me. <laughs> but I don't know what I would grab. I don't know my laptop. I don't know. Uh, Brian, I'd save you. Uh, good, good answer. Good Thank answer. You. And and actually, that is that it relates to your character because you are big with with community, and when it has, yeah, I'm coming back to that. So you're big with community. I think when it comes to business, uh, the first thing you think about, the first thing that you look to address is your your community. So if you're starting a company and it's just you and one other person, or let's just say it's just you, the way you communicate with yourself, right? Uh, there's a lot going on with a business owner. He's got a, a lot of uh, hashtag brain share, right? Joe Kaczynski. Uh, there's a lot of parts working together in order to produce a company. And then once you bring in somebody else, that is another part of your company. So the, the way that you communicate the messaging to them, uh, I think it needs to stay consistent. Interesting. The, the self-communication, the communication to your team, the communication to investors, communication to, to everyone. How, I mean, it sounds like communication is actually, even though here, most people think, you know, you're an engineer or you're a doctor or whatever, it sounds like communication is actually super powerful. Yeah, it's, it, it is. Because relationships, I think, are the number one thing that we're after. If, if you're just after the dollar in, in business, you're, you're going to lose. It's, it's just my take. You're, you're going to lose. If you're just after the cash, uh, if you're just product product focused i mean this is going to sound like an oxymoron uh you're going to lose and, and that sounds crazy because ultimately what you're doing with that product is you're connecting it to people and if you don't understand or empathize with those you are leading those who you're serving uh you're 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 in trouble i often tell people that i'm i'm coaching is i'll say don't fall in love with your product or service because if you fall in love with your product or your service you may miss the market and the market has a problem that you're looking to solve. And if you don't make that connection, much like the Visby medical example, they pivoted. If you can't pivot, if you're so in love with your product or service, you may run yourself right off, right off the road. Okay. So going back, we talked a little bit about, you know, that first step, but tell me some tips, some tricks to become a better communicator. What's some things that I can start today? To learn or to do well i think it's it starts with this is something i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to work on uh i think the fire drill is important so if you're going to tell me about what the silicon valley podcast is you know what would it sound like in 15 seconds and get get yourself a partner get yourself a coach get your get yourself into a community toastmasters right it's a free community uh, get yourself somewhere where people can give you feedback on your messaging. So that soundboard, I think, is the number one thing that you should get get yourself. Get yourself a soundboard. You know, does it is it is it is it communicating the right message? So that's one. Uh, two would be the, be the fire drill. Are you commu communicating the priorities? Two is what is the value prop of your messaging? So if you're trying to sell your product, if you're trying to present to funders, if you're trying to onboard an employee, if you're trying to, uh, whatever the message may be, a town hall, board meeting, whatever it may be. What else should I be asking you about this? I think a good question is, is communication just words? And I would say absolutely not. Right. So content is important. That would be the words, right? That'd be the information. Context. That's, you know, who are you presenting to? Right. So connecting. The other piece is yourself as a communicator, the, the emotional intelligent piece. And this is overlooked a lot. It's a connection from the head to the heart. So a big piece of communication is focused also on understanding what EQ is. So as a, as an EQ coach, I mean, that's not my title, but someone who trains on that. I look at five different points. Uh, the first one is the vulnerability, the vulnerability piece. You know, you are coming outside your comfort zone to be a better communicator. You're addressing a pain point and the ability to relate to other people's pain points and coming outside their comfort zone 
is huge. So understanding vulnerability, understanding what you don't know and admitting that. The second piece is back to the values, right? Because once you are outside your comfort zone, anchoring that to values will generate relationships and progression. Then vision, taking multiple perspectives on vision, the ability to do that. Voice, obviously what we're talking about here, what you say to yourself, what you say to others, and what you hear. And finally, uh, uh, validation, right? Making sure that what is said and what is done is congruent. So there's a congruency message that's very important. There's a lot going on here that's, you know, it's hard to squeeze in in the 30 minutes, but uh, we work on we work on these these tools and these tricks for up to a year, if not more, with some of our clients. So how long does it take? I mean, you said you work on this with some of your clients for a year. How long does it take on average to become a good communicator? Well, I think it's something that you should consistently be working on. Uh, it's like working out. It's like, how, how long does it take to get in shape? And then once the, are you in shape, just stay in shape? No, you got to consistently work on your messaging. It's something you should be consistently doing because times are changing, especially if you have your ear to the ground as a, as a leader, you're going to have to pivot. And those pivots will require different messaging. So it, it's, it's again, content, con, content will determine, or con, excuse me, context will determine content. So if you have, if you have a board meeting or a, or a conference that you are giving a great presentation to, uh, you want to give yourself six months to get ready for that because that could be a, make a big impact on your company. So you want to give yourself some time. But if you're constantly in front of the mic, if you're constantly going to conferences, if, if you're required to speak continuously as a CEO of a company, then it's something you should be working on all the time. You'd mentioned giving speeches at conferences and that there's been many times where I've seen people give presentations and I think there's a disconnect between the slides up on stage and what they're saying. How do you create your messaging so that they align so that you utilize the slides up on stage to the maximum. The slides complement what your words are to the maximum. The biggest mistake that people can do is put their presentation up on a slide. There's just too much information. We call it the three second rule. If your slide goes up and I have to look at it or look away from you for more than three seconds, there's too much up there. So there should be some just basic imagery and then people should be looking at you. Those slides are up there as a tool to complement what you're saying. And you want to be greedy with your time. You don't want people looking away from you, having to read your slides. So a lot of time, just the aesthetics of a slide need to be worked on. And then the communicator, or the, the presenter needs to, you know, how do you articulate that or develop the word power to take what's off the slide and bring it back into your, your presentation? Wait, so Brian, I mean, we've gone over quite a bit of information today. In a short amount of time, this has been fantastic. Can you summarize kind of the key message for our listeners before we wrap it up? Well, first of all, if, if you are consistently working on your communication skills, you're ahead of the game. Really, you are ahead of the game if you are focused on your communication skills. Because again, remember, you're only as good as you can communicate. Even if you have the unicorn idea, product or service, it's not going to be perceived as that unless you can communicate it. That's, that's number one. The second piece, I think, is to remember when communicating is to cast a clear vision, number one. Uh, number two to that is to anchor it to values. And number three to that is, you know, what are you committed to in action steps? Like, what is going to be the result? What is going to be the outcome? What do you promise? This is your, your bold promise. That is, I think, uh, the, the second piece. And then finally, context, context determines content. And as long as you have a message portfolio, as we talked a little bit about earlier, like every situation is going to require something different. You have that in your pocket or in your arsenal. I think there's any, situ any situation you come across, you're able to communicate precisely and concisely so that your message is, is received. And you also mentioned you're currently working with the Hero Voice Academy you'd like to give a plug for that or tell us a little bit about that, please go ahead. So at the Heroic Voice Academy, we take on those who have high stakes conversation and help them prepare with a message portfolio. So uh, go to, you can go to heroicvoice.com and you can find me there. You can find Anthony there. You can find the entire team there. 
it again, if you are in a position of leadership or have any high stakes conversations coming up, I suggest you connect with us. We also provide the presentation gym every week, Thursday from 12 to 1. You can go to heroic voice slash gym and sign up. That's free. So we'll teach you one slide, one skill every week. It's great. We have a great turnout to that. So you're invited to come to that. When you're saying one slide, one skill, can you share some of these skills that you'd learn over the period of time? Sure. So top of mind, you meant, earlier you mentioned the, the team slide. Uh, and what you want to do when you're talking about the team slide is remember you're telling a story about a teammate. You're not reading a resume. So the ability to articulate who you're working with, what they can do, and how they complement the team, we quickly outline that with, with one skill. And, and show you from an aesthetic point of view what your slide should, work, should look like when you, when you do that. Come check us out. We'll show you how to do that. And we, we have it on a nine-week rotation. So every week we will show you from a nine, I think, nine-slide pitch deck from the intro to the financials to the team slide, uh, what each slide should look like and sound like. Fantastic. And Brian, yourself, what's your focus right now with helping people and how can they get a in contact with you. So right now, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Go find me at uh, Brian Sparks. You can email me at uh, Brian at BrianSparks.com. You can give me a phone call at 408-992-5043. Uh, I'm an executive communication coach and executive business coach. And I work with those who have a high stakes uh, conversations coming up in the startup world. Fantastic. All that information is going to be in our show notes. And for our audience out there, while you're listening to this, I know you're going to be listening to it multiple times. Give us a five-star review on any of the platforms you're listening to it on. I mean, iTunes, wherever. It helps us get our message out there. It gives us a little bit of oomph and excitement to create more episodes. And also for our audience out there, if you're looking for that investment banker, here's my little elevator pitch. You go through life, you meet that special someone, you get married, that's a merger. Maybe you see that puppy on the side of the street, you want to bring it into your family, that's an acquisition. That puppy is going to need to go to the vet, it's going to need food, it needs growth capital. All these transactions that happen in life, I help with companies, I help with those transactions in business. So connect with me on LinkedIn, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, F-L-Y-N-N. I am here at thesiliconvalleypodcast.com, once again, thesiliconvalleypodcast.com, and connect with me. And with that, Brian, I want to thank you for taking the time today to be on this week's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. And with that, we also want to thank Han Hai for hosting us in their facility for this amazing interview. We want to thank Hero Voice Academy for just a long-term relationship and, and always promoting and helping each other out. And with that, one more time, Brian, thank you again for this week's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. Sean, thank you. This has been wonderful. You're an amazing host. And I love what you're doing with your hair. Thank you. <laughs>